Now on BBC One, look up. Good evening, and welcome to the first Sky at Night of the New Millennium. And first, may I thank all those very kind people who have written to me after I was given a knighthood. I have had hundreds of letters, and of course I am replying, and I really am very grateful indeed. Thank you very much. A couple of news notes. The giant planet Jupiter is now high up after dark, and the telescope shows its yellow disk, its belts, and its four bright moons, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. On December the 30th, the Cassini spacecraft, on its way to Saturn, bypassed Jupiter and sent back pictures, including this one, there it is, the red spot to the left there, and the shadow transit of the volcanic satellite Io, and Cassini actually got a close-up of Io, and there it is, with its hot spots and its volcanoes. Incidentally, look at Jupiter telescopically. About 4.15 on January the 15th, you'll see something rather interesting. Io about to enter transit, and Ganymede just about to leave. A rather rare coincidence. Then, of course, the eclipse of the Moon on January the 9th. Begins 6.40, ended 10 o'clock, and total 7.58 to 8.50. An eclipse of the Moon happens when the Moon passes into the shadow cast by the Earth, and often turns a dim or red coppery colour, because all the light reaching the eclipse Moon has to be bent onto it by way of the Earth's atmosphere, and that causes the colour. And this rather lovely series by Douglas Arnold shows what happens. Of course, the middle one, the eclipse moon, is enhanced with it can be quite dark. These eclipses are not important. They are great fun to watch. And now, on to our main theme. How were the Earth and the planets actually formed? Until recently, the only planets we knew were those of our own solar system. Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and the rest. But in 1992, there was an interesting claim that a planet had been found orbiting another celestial body. Well, I must admit, on this one, I am highly sceptical that the report was there. Now, welcome back to one of our regular visitors, Professor Chris Kitchen. Hello, Patrick. That uh, 1992 discovery was very unexpected, wasn't it? Yes, it was really quite extraordinary. The planets were orbiting the remnants of a star that had become a supernova. Uh, the remnants had, of course, collapsed down to form an ultra-compressed neutron star, which we can nowadays pick up using radio telescopes as a pulsar on the edge of the constellation of Virgo. There it is, PSR 257 plus 12. I am bound to admit, you know, that the discovery of a pulsar planet I view with considerable scepticism. <laughs> Yes, and I think a lot of people do, but uh, if they're there, then there are in fact three or even four planets, uh, each of them not much larger than the Earth, and most of them closer to the pulsar than the Earth is to the Sun. They were discovered, uh, if discovered they were, uh, because pulsars normally emit their radio bleeps at extremely regular intervals. For PSR 1257 plus 12, the timings, however, varied by the incredibly minute amount of 10 million millionths of a second. Those period variations arose because the planet's gravitational fields would be pulling the pulsar backwards and forwards by small amounts, far too small to be seen here, but nonetheless the details of the planets could then be determined uh, from the period variations. If those planets had been there before the star exploded as a supernova, then they would actually have been inside the star. They cannot possibly, therefore, have been there before the star became a supernova, but must have formed perhaps from the debris of the explosion or perhaps from a companion star that was disrupted by the supernova. But then, in 1995, uh, another planet was found outside the solar system, but in a much more normal to be expected place around the solar type star 51 Pegasi. Well I'm much happier about that than I am about the pulsar planet, but even so, if the 51 Pegasi planet is there, in some ways it's a curious place, isn't it? Yes, the planet itself is about one and a half times the mass of Saturn, which makes it large but not enormous, it's still only half the size of Jupiter but it is nearly 200 times closer to its star than Saturn is to the Sun. 
In fact, even Mercury is eight times further than, from the Sun than this planet is from 51 Pegasi. If the planet were like the Earth, then its surface temperature would be in the region of 1200 degrees Kelvin. That is quite hot enough to melt many rocks. Uh, even this, the basalt which forms most of the uh, floor of the Earth's oceans. But of course, with a mass half that of Jupiter, it is almost certainly a gas giant. But its closeness to the star means that even Jupiter's 300 km an hour hurricanes must seem like gentle breezes. One rather worrying point about that, though, if this gas giant is so close to the star, it is so hot it will be in danger of being evaporated completely. Well, at 1200 degrees Kelvin, the average velocity of the gas molecules in the planet would be about 5 kilometers per second. But that is only an average, and some molecules will be moving faster, and some will be moving slower. Because of the faster moving molecules, if a planet is going to retain its atmosphere over thousands of millions of years, uh, then the uh, escape velocity from the planet must be at least five times the average velocity uh, of the, the molecules. Now the escape velocity depends upon both the mass of the planet and its size. The smaller the planet and the higher the mass, the higher the escape velocity. For Saturn, which is a very low density and therefore large for its mass, uh, the escape velocity is 37 kilometers per second. And even that is over seven times the uh, average velocity of gas molecules at 1200 degrees Kelvin. So the 51 peg planet would be able to retain uh, its hydrogen molecules, and since the uh, hydrogen is the lightest and fastest moving molecule, the planet will in fact be able to retain all its gases. Interesting though that all the planets reported since then of other stars seem to be much more like the 51 Pegasi planet than anyone in our own solar system. Uh, yes, the uh, large planets close to the star seem to be the rule. They are being discovered quite regularly now and something in the region of 50 planets have been found around stars plus another 15 which are free floating uh, in space. Interesting, these free floaters, discovered, I believe, by your colleague, Phil Lucas. Indeed. Uh, he and uh, Patrick Roche from Oxford discovered them uh, using the UK Infrared Telescope in Hawaii. They are found in the midst of the Orion Nebula, uh, where we know also that new stars are being formed. Uh, on this false colour image, we can see uh, objects which are hot, uh, but not as hot as stars, and if we compare it with a visual image that we would normally see, such as this one, you can see the differences. Many of these planets, both the free floaters and those attached to stars, are several times the mass of Jupiter. And for most of the stars, we only know of one planet, though for Upsilon Andromedae, uh, there are three, ranging in mass from 0.7 to 4.6, times the mass of Jupiter, and out to two and a half times the distance of the Earth uh, from the Sun. But even that is only half the distance of uh, Jupiter from the, from the Sun. These results make it look as though the solar system is unusual in having lots of planets, uh, many of them quite small, and out to large distances from the Sun. Could be. It is, of course, possible that the solar system is unusual, but what is more likely to be happening is that because of the way the planets are being detected, we are only picking up 51 Pegasi-type systems at the moment. Probably, when observational techniques improve, we will start to detect systems like the uh, solar system. So far, we've not actually seen any of these planets. Even the Hubble telescope has to be able to do that. So we depend entirely upon the effects they have upon the star's movement by pulling on their parent stars. Yes, when a star has a planet in orbit around it, the star is also moving in an orbit. In fact, the two objects move around their common centre of mass. But the sizes of the orbits are inversely proportional to the masses involved. And so the velocities through space are inversely proportional as well. For example, the Earth uh, moving around the centre of mass of the Earth and Sun does so at a velocity of 30 kilometres per second and at, at a distance of 150 million kilometres, while the Sun orbiting the same centre of mass yes. is moving at just 9 centimetres a second and at an orbital radius of 460 kilometres. 
the movement is detected from the star's spectrum as the spectral line shifts backwards and forwards because of the famous Doppler effect. Mm. For 51 Pegasi, the movement's roughly 100 mph over a 4.2 day period. And the star's orbit around the centre of mass between itself and the planet is roughly 2,000 miles. Yes, but measuring Doppler shifts is a much less precise process than being able to time a pulsar. So it is the large, fast-moving planets like 51 Pegasi which we're finding at the moment. But whether the solar system is unusual or not, it is becoming clear that uh, many stars have planetary systems and that uh, the formation of planets must be a normal part of the formation of a star. Because I remember the time, you won't, when most people believed in the theory championed by Sir James Jeans that the planets were formed by the action of a passing star which drew a tongue of material off the sun, a kind of cigar material, which broke up into planets. But there were mathematical objections to that one. And of course, stars are a long way apart. And I don't think anyone believes in that theory now. No, uh, close passages between stars, such as required for James Jeans' theory, are very, very rare. Even in a galaxy as large as our own Milky Way, which is a large galaxy, uh, only one or two stars would be expected to have planets out of the 100,000 million that are there if this was the process that produced them. There are still problems in explaining how planets are formed, um, but it almost certainly occurs in the disk of gas and dust that surrounds young stars. We can see these disks directly in the infrared, such as this image of uh, Beta Pictoris, uh, or sometimes in the visible, as on this image taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, of the object HH30. Uh, here, the star in the centre is hidden by the gas and dust of the disk. We can see the top and bottom of the disk, but the centre of that is also obscured by dust clouds. The orange lines to the left and right in this image are jets of material being flung out by the central star. Let's have a look at one of these particles, shall we? Here it is, collected from space by NASA. Impressive, in fact, a tiny thing, only a few microns across. It's rather amazing to think that stars and planets are built up from particles that size. Yes, but almost, certain that must, almost certainly that is how it must occur. The dust particles are moving rapidly around the star, and if they were to collide head-on, they would completely disintegrate. But they're all moving in roughly the same direction and at roughly the same speed, so the collisions between them are quite gentle, and the particles will stick together, building up to larger and larger grains, and then in turn to larger and larger particles, perhaps in the course of time, ending up like this fragment of the Allende meteorite, which is thought to have been left over mm. from the formation of the solar system. Process continues until those originally micron-sized uh, dust particles have built up to objects maybe five or ten kilometers across. At that stage, they're often called planetesimals and would perhaps resemble um, this uh, image <laughs> of the asteroid Castalia, uh, which indeed looks exactly like mm. two planetesimals stuck together or on a slightly larger scale, the, asteroid, uh, the satellites of Mars, Phobos and Deimos. But think of the millions of millions of millions of tiny particles needed to build up even the small planetesimal. It's staggering, isn't it? Yes, but they're all still concentrated in the disk, thin disk surrounding the protosun. And there will continue to be collisions between the planetesimals. And as with the dust particles, these will be at low relative velocities. So they will continue to grow through the size of an object like the asteroid Cleopatra, which again looks like two things that have just stuck together. Oh, a dog's bone, I think. <laughs> Indeed, though it would be a rather big dog. The asteroid is 200 kilometres long. And so on, up to objects thousands, uh, hundreds, thousands of kilometres across, uh, like Uranus's moon Umbriel, Saturn's moon Enceladus. Yes, this is all very well for small planets, I mean Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars and so on, but uh, for the big planets, the gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn and the rest, the picture's not quite the same. Well, it probably starts off in much the same sort of way, but the newly forming planets would still be embedded in a thick cloud of gas. Uh, the temperature in that gas would decrease away from the proto-sun at its centre. 
So when the proto-Jupiter, or proto-Saturn, reached about the size of the Earth now, uh, its gravitational field would become strong enough to attract the material in the gas directly. And once that happened, the planets would grow very, very rapidly. Like a snowball rolling downhill, uh, the material being gathered by the planet would increase its gravitational field, enabling more and more material to be gathered. Ending up as the gas giants, largely formed from hydrogen and helium, but probably still with a core of largely terrestrial type material. But the accretion of dust particles and planetesimals is probably not all that was, formed, that was involved in the formation of the Earth and the Moon. Because there is one problem. These two objects are very close together in space, but they do have different compositions. And they're different size and different mass. Obviously, the Earth weighs 81 times as much as the Moon. But certainly, I agree, both have rocky surfaces, and both do have cores. But in the case of the Moon, the core is smaller than that of the Earth, both absolutely and relatively. Yes, the Apollo Moon missions have shown that the Moon is largely rocky all the way through. While the Earth has a very large core made up of nickel and iron, um, same sort of composition as this iron meteorite here, but of course nowadays liquid in the centre of the Earth. It's suggested then that what happened is that the Earth formed, as we've discussed, by the accretion of dust particles and planetesimals, and once it was formed, radioactivity would heat up its interior until it melted. At that stage, the heavy elements, like nickel and iron, would sink through to the centre, forming the core, and leaving a largely rocky shell uh, as the outer part of the Earth. At that stage, another object, possibly as large as Mars, collided with the Earth. The debris from that collision, largely from the rocky outer part of the Earth, plus some material from the colliding object, uh, eventually went to form the Moon. Well, that's only one theory, there are others, but if that collision theory is right, then systems like the Earth and the Moon together must be rather rare, I think. Yes, and of course, if life requires uh, the conditions that we have here on the Earth in order to start, uh, in order to start uh, then it's going to mean that little green men and women are going to be very few and far between. Maybe, but I'm sure there's plenty of life up there. After 100,000 million stars in our galaxy, in many Earths, we get a deal of life, I'm sure. But after all, we are now discovering new planets around other stars at the rate of, well, quite a number per year. And I wonder, when will we actually start to see them? Because I can hardly wait. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Patrick. Well, it's uh, Newsletter time. If you want it, send your stamped address envelope to Newsletter number 80, The Sky at Night, BBC TV, London, w 12 ts Of course, our website, www.bbc.co.uk slash sky at night, or tune into CFAX, page 620. And let's hope with some clearer skies in the first part of our new millennium. So now, the next month, good night.